Hope everybody is doing well. Um, we're about to start medical grand rounds. One one uh, announcement I'll make now, which I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about at the end of uh, this lecture today, is uh, thanks to our CME folks, uh, it, it, we will be able to offer CME for both this medical grand rounds, all the previous uh, medical grand rounds we've been doing since we moved to this theme uh, of COVID theme lectures, uh, and as well as future ones as well. So I'm going to send uh, have more information on that on the end of, uh, of the presentation today, and I'll also send some information via the chat function here to make sure everybody can log in as uh, um, in their CME accounts and get CME really easily. So today I'll refer you over to a website to make sure you have your CME account and you can grab CME for this and previous lectures. Uh, and then in the future, you'll just be able to simply send a text message during our lecture uh, really quickly and you can grab CME for this. Also, I just will point out CME has done a great job of allowing you to get CME credit for all sorts of school of medicine lectures. They have a website, I'll send that as well in the chat function. So um, uh, everybody can still grab CME really easily for all these lectures from home. Um, so with that being said, I see we have a lot of people joining in. Uh, Dr. Harrington, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Earl. Thanks for setting it up. And uh, thanks to our CME colleagues for, uh, for making CME available. I know that's been a big ask of, uh, of the participants in this. Well, as Errol said, this continues in our, uh, in our mode of uh, COVID-focused medical grand rounds uh, via the Zoom function. Uh, this week, we're going to have an update from some of our leaders across the department and across the, uh, the health system to give us an update on what's going on locally. Then we're going to have a presentation by Tate Chenefeld, a professor of medicine and the chief wellness officer for, uh, for Stanford Medicine. Tate's done really a fantastic job of trying to keep some focus on, uh, on wellness and trying to, uh, to keep that conversation going throughout this uh, epidemic. And then we'll do the usual of opening it up to questions moderated by uh, producer extraordinaire, Errol. So we'll, uh, we'll be able to take your questions. Please do use the uh, Q&A function. And as Errol likes to note, if you can upvote, uh, that will allow us to answer the most pressing questions of the audience. So with that, let me turn to Dr. Norm Risk, our uh, Chief Medical Officer for Stanford Healthcare and our Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs at Stanford School of Medicine. Norm. Thank you so much, um, Bob. I was going to start out with um, a look at the bigger picture in Santa Clara County and then come down to our local situation. Can I have the next slide, Errol? Sure. <clears throat> so um, if you look in the left-hand panel, you can see the California hospitalizations over a four-day period going from 746 to 1,617. And I think this underlines uh, that the surge is coming. It's maybe not as um, steep a slope as in New York, but it, it's definitely with us. About 40% of the California patients are hospitalized in an ICU. And you can see the hot spots um, in the purple shadowing. Show me the next slide. If you look at um, Santa Clara County, on the left, you'll see that we have about 890, 900 cases. And the age distribution is uh, really middle age. It goes from about uh, 31 to, to 60 mostly. But if you look in the right-hand side where it shows the 30 deaths, you can see we're seeing the same distribution of deaths as they have in other sites, largely in the 60 to 90-year-old group despite them being a disproportionately small number of the overall cases. And we're seeing the same gender distribution. 77% of the deaths in Santa Clara County have been male. Um, so this mirrors everybody else's experience with it. <clears throat> and above that, you can see comorbidities, one or more comorbidities were, um, were largely present in the cases that succumbed. Can I show the next slide? Um, you can't really read this, it's an eye chart, but what I wanted to say is
Errol, we're getting notices that he's frozen. Yeah, I was wondering if it was me or him. It's okay. Um, I think we just. Sorry, that continues. Uh... No, can you hear us? Yep. Sorry, I don't know the the uh, internet failed there for a second. Can you go to the next slide? One more. Okay. Locally, in our own hospital. The gray shows the patients that have been admitted um, who were um, patients on the wards, and the red is the ICU cases. So the ICU cases you can see are gradually increasing. We had a, a, a bump in the uh, COVID cases around 315 when our turnaround time for testing got very long, but it came back down and um, the more reliable index of the gradual surging is the ICU admissions. So what I want to talk about now is <clears throat> what we're doing about the surge. So this week we opened up D1 as all ICU beds and D2 as, uh, sim as uh, ward beds where we can co-locate people. Uh, we can still open L4 as an ICU with 20 beds or even E29. We've been, index, we've been uh, accessing the state reserve ventilators and uh, we're putting them through biomedical engineering right now to make sure they're serviceable, but they appear to be. In IT, now 73% of our visits are on telemedicine and we're working on building Zoom into Epic, which will take several months. Uh, you'll notice that we don't need to go into rooms as much in COVID-19 patients because we have iPads deployed in and out of the rooms. And now we have um, starting telesitter high, high uh, definition Zoom cameras so that we can look in detail at people in the room. Um, in our testing, uh, we've done about 7,000 tests. They're 8.5% positive. Uh, the last day we did 377 and 44 were positive. I want to reassure everybody about occupational health. We've done about 1,300 um, occupational health um, tests and 2.8% of them have been positive. Mostly these are community spread and um, we know that that community spread is um, uh, present because of people in households that had it and spread it to our healthcare wake workers. Um, in Santa Clara County also, we have an option for uh, putting patients eventually in the Santa Clara Convention Center if this really gets out of hand, but we're hoping it's not going to go there. And the last thing I want to say is about high-risk patients. Um, we're about to um, put out a guidance about high-risk um, patient exposure uh, for, for healthcare workers that are older or have comorbidities. And um, this will, I think, facilitate uh, maintaining uh, minimum exposure. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Earl. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Risk. And OK, uh, Nira, would you like to go next, Dr. Huja? Good morning, everyone. You know, I wanted to acknowledge a group of frontline providers that I think need some acknowledgement, and they are our house staff. When you think about what happens when you interview for residency, the climate of that time of residency interviews is what you anticipate um, happening. And what's interesting is at the time of their interview, things are calm, everyone's happy. But the two things that were unprepared for by our house staff were one, the post 500p volume surge, and then second, COVID-19. And our house staff have come forth with courage and camaraderie. And this would be one of those times where if we were all in the room together, I think we would stand up and applaud them. So just a big shout out to our house staff and our residency leaders. The, um, I know that Dr. Risk mentioned our uh, current numbers, and I want to just acknowledge that on our medicine wards, which is one of the biggest places that the COVID positive patients come to, we have been manageable actually on the, quite on the low side for all of our teaching services and non-teaching services. So we have not had to activate any surge teams yet, but with the help of Jeff Chi and many in the division, in the department and extra department people, we do have planning to go up to four teams deep. 
And what that would look like is to have one attending and three house staff. And if we needed to, we have the help of Vicki Tippett and her uh, PAs and APs that would help us as well. And so, um, you know, we hope we don't have to go four teams deep, but if we do, we have that ability. I want to acknowledge with the help of Ann Weinecker, we have reached out to other departments and they've actually proactively even reached out to us about, you know, how can they help the Department of Orthopedics and Bill Mahoney, uh, Dr. Jackler from ENT. And it's been really nice to see that, um, that volunteerism. And what I've learned from it is how many different departments have board certified inter internists in their department, like dermatology, uh, ENT, uh, vascular surgery. So we will be relying on you. So <laughs> get ready for us to reach out. Finally, I wanted to mention, you know, although we are anticipating, you know, uh, what to do in this COVID situation, we have to be very aware of the post-COVID surge that may happen with patients who are prolonging or postponing surgeries, patients with oncologic issues um, who may not be able to come in right away or may not be urgently needing treatment now, rheumatologic conditions, et cetera. And in preparing for that, our department is working on creating a new service that will help support uh, this volume and be a teaching service for PA students. So um, more to come on that. And I think it'll be a nice multidisciplinary service. And then finally, I wanted to mention skilled nursing facilities. As we know, patients um, who come from a skilled nursing facility now need repeat testing of COVID before they go back, before that skilled nursing facility will take them. However, some skilled nursing facilities are now gonna develop on-site testing. It is not clear what they will do if the test is positive and the patient doesn't meet inpatient criteria. So we need to work on that because we don't want just everyone with a positive test that could be managed in the outpatient setting to be admitted. Unfortunately, no skilled nursing facility has committed to being a COVID sniff. Um, you know, obviously there's risks under that and there's some labeling and connotations that go along with that. There have been some hotels that have been willing to open up their rooms and doors for skilled nursing patients, but it doesn't seem like they have a safe way to manage each patient independently and they would be very low risk, stable, non-demented, no behavioral issue type patients. So there's still more to come on that. Um, I will stop there and turn it back over to Errol. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Huja. Wonderful. Um, uh, we'll move on next to Dr. Megan Mahoney and I'll pull your slides up. Okay, great. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks, Errol. Um, so over the um, last week in ambulatory care, uh, we continue to um, be very proud of um, the video visit engagement. All of the barriers have essentially been eliminated and ambulatory providers, even those who never really completed a video visit before are exhibiting their best website manner. Um, and it's also impressive to see and acknowledge uh, the patients across age and gender demographics who've quickly adopted this new technology. And um, we're already thinking about how we might be able to leverage uh, the learnings uh, during this period of time to manifest our digital first strategy, um, which will likely continue post COVID. Also, over the last week, there's been a ramping up of testing in the drive through clinics um, as testing capacity increases. And, you know, as we know, Stanford Express Care opened one of the nation's first drive through clinics within days after the FDA approval of the Stanford test. And the citation of their publication is included below at the bottom part of the slide. Um, the highly uh, efficient model has since been replicated at six additional sites across the Bay Area, as seen in the map to the right. And as of today, over 3,000 patients have been tested among the uh, seven sites. As testing capacity expands, the drive through clinic testing sites are now a system asset and several uh, uh, divisions within Department of Medicine and other departments have begun referring patients to schedule a test at one of the drive through uh, sites, given its convenience, efficiency, and safety. And instructions on how to refer eligible patients and the updated testing prioritization will be coming out soon. Um, in the meantime, feel free to email me directly in the amatory care space if uh, you have um, any questions about that. 
And then our mitigation tactics in ambulatory have begun to focus on active clinical monitoring and follow-up of COVID patients. Across ambulatory, including UHA, there are three COVID-19 clinics, with one coming online in Palo Alto soon. And registries and protocols for care of COVID-19 patients will be uh, helpful in this effort, and we've begun to characterize the clinical course of positive patients in our population, especially those who are at high risk uh, for ED and hospital emissions. And these clinics can serve also as a base uh, for outpatient research necessary to discover the therapeutic, prophylactic, and preventative uh, interventions that are going to be effective against COVID. And then finally, for wellness, I uh, just wanted to express gratitude to Dr. Shannonfeld and the WellMD Well PhD uh, program for setting up so many opportunities uh, that will support us and keep us thriving. I'm eager to hear his presentation to, uh, this morning. Um, but on the next slide, um, it's heartwarming to see uh, on the next slide. Uh, yeah, uh, heartwarming to see that over two. 100,000 items, including PPE and testing supplies, have been donated to, to Stanford. And to celebrate Doctor's Day, Amanda Chawa, uh, who oversees the supply chain and coordinates these donations, shared uh, this uh, thanks from our community slide with photos of some of the notes left by our donors. And um, so please, uh, hopefully, you can uh, get a, a chance to read some of these. Uh, my favorite is, for nurses and doctors fighting against the virus, remember to never give up on your dreams. Thank you. Thanks so much, Megan. That was wonderful. Moving on, uh, Dr. Song Chang, who uh, oversees occupational health, uh, uh, is also going to just mention a few updates and is available for questions as well. Hi, thanks. Good morning. Uh, Norm, I think, covered uh, the gist of it, so I'll make my uh, comments very brief. Uh, our uh, volume of testing has remained uh, pretty stable at about 100 a day, and the positives uh, continue to remain uh, remarkably low. 3% on average, uh, zero to four uh, per day. There hasn't been a faculty or, or resident that's been positive in over a week, so I think we're doing a really good job uh, protecting ourselves. Uh, but the positives have actually been in non-patient facing areas, and so we're escalating our uh, protective uh, measures for that population uh, uh, in call centers, uh, EVS, and so forth. Uh, a couple uh, important uh, uh, changes we've made is we're going to start retesting uh, every uh, positive healthcare worker before we uh, clear them to return to work to protect our uh, workforce. And we've had the first person who's come up for uh, 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 return to work uh, clearance, and they were symptomatic. Uh, they were symptom free, but they were still test positive, and so we're going to keep them off the line. Uh, there's a possibility that they're non-contagious, but until we uh, understand that uh, more effectively, uh, we think that it's wisest to uh, ask them to stay off the line. Uh, we're integrating our uh, two EPIC records. We had to partition the two systems so that uh, confidentiality was maintained, but that was a real barrier to uh, effective uh, uh, tracking of our workforce, and so today we're going live with an integrated medical record. Wow, both sides see each other's records, and that's going to help us a lot be able to uh, track and monitor our uh, our positive uh, employees. Okay, great, Song. Thank you so much uh, as well for all those updates and for being with us today. Um, and with that, uh, Dr. Harrington, I'll turn it back over to you, perhaps to introduce Dr. Shanafelt. Yeah, so it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Tay Chanafeld, who joined us from Mayo Clinic to uh, create and to lead our WellMD, Well PhD Center. He, Tate is now our Chief Wellness Officer. Uh, we're also pleased that he's a professor of medicine in our Division of Hematology. So, Tate, thank you for your leadership during this trying time, and uh, we look forward to your grand rounds today. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me. Um, and it uh, looks like Errol's launched on the slides. Uh, really wanted to just provide a focused presentation today on what is in place now and being developed to provide support to our workforce during this time and uh, in today's session I'll really focus on what has been stood up for our physicians, residents, uh, fellows uh, and is available uh, currently. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, I'll say that uh, a couple weeks ago 
Uh, we begin this effort in addition to uh, using some common sense and experience from other centers uh, of what is needed, uh, but begin by really engaging all of you in understanding what your needs were, your sources of concern and anxiety. We had uh, eight sessions of different clinical groups. A number of you participated in these. And what was notable is that there were eight core concerns that just kept coming up repeatedly across all of these groups. And they thematically really grouped into five areas. So if we can go to the next slide, uh, the, the concerns uh, really centered around hear me, protect me, prepare me, support me, care for me. And unpacking those, you know, the hear me notion was giving an opportunity for people to voice what their specific needs and concerns were. Uh, and being receptive to those, as well as allowing their expertise to be part of the developing organizational response. The second piece uh, centered around protecting our healthcare workforce, reducing our risk of infection, uh, and also the risk or the concern that we are, are, will be a portal of transmission to our own loved ones. The prepare me piece in a sense is preparing us for potential redeployment and having to care for patients outside the areas where we usually practice. The support me piece is perhaps the most intuitive uh, of just meeting tangible needs for healthcare workers, uh, working increased hours and perhaps even rapid cycle shifts. And then people wanting to know with certainty that the organization will provide support to them and their family if they go on quarantine. So next slide, if I just uh, briefly um, move through this, you can go ahead uh, one more. Uh, on this Hear Me theme, I think you've seen a number of efforts across Stanford Medicine to uh, provide avenues for you to both receive updates, but also to uh, interject your questions, comments, concerns into the conversation. Uh, through some of the town halls that we have every week, through forums like uh, Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, our team has been continuing to conduct regular listening sessions with physicians, residents, uh, and fellows, uh, nurses, and APPs to just understand what's changing as the needs evolve. Um, so we, we had our most recent physician session yesterday evening. Uh, and I just emphasize here too, we uh, have really been asking folks to send us messages in uh, my chief wellness officer at stanford.edu inbox if there are specific things you need or help you need that you haven't yet uh, uh, been able to identify the support and resource, please just reach out to, to me there. But we're continuing to want to be listening and responding to your needs and concerns. If we go to the next slide, uh, I think, you know, here, uh, what I would emphasize uh, is that there's nothing more focused and fundamental to the wellness of our people right now than our conversations around PPE and rapid access to testing and occupational health. And I think that's why that's been such a focal area over the last several weeks is that's really the base of the pyramid for all of us is to know that we will be protected to the greatest extent possible uh, in the current situation when we come to work and show up for our patients and our colleagues. Uh, Song articulated, I think, very well the uh, remarkable work uh, done in occupational health. I, I, I can't overstate how incredible what that team has done over the last two and a half to three weeks has been uh, you know, building a clinic that didn't exist to one that's capable of seeing over 200 patients a day and getting all of the electronic interfaces and the turnaround times and so forth accelerated. And so most of our folks now are being able to be seen and have a result uh, within 24 hours, which is very different than where we were several weeks ago. Um, we've, uh, whoop, we lost there, um, and then how do we avoid taking these home for our family? I'll just have some basic tips on next slide, but also here uh, the guidelines for faculty and staff who are at increased risk uh, based on age. Uh, th those uh, guidelines and, and policies are coming to the court team today for approval. And so hopefully within the next 24 hours, you'll have some additional guidance about if you're in a high risk group yourself, 
uh, we want to make sure you're protected and that it's easy for you to have the accommodations you need to be protected. Uh, I won't go through all the uh, updated PPE guidelines, but I do want to emphasize here that over the last two weeks, um, through some wonderful leadership by our department chairs and other leaders, really a, a many voices were drawn into this conversation uh, with a number of chairs, faculty members, residents and fellows, uh, our infection control team, people across the organization to understand uh, all elements of people's uh, requests as well as just the evidence of what was needed to understand where our highest risk areas are and to make sure we're uh, optimally protecting our people. And so I think these updated guidelines uh, have really uh, taken us a step forward and uh, these continue to be regularly evaluated as the prevalence of the virus in the community increases. Uh, as we determine when do we need to be uh, just moving toward even higher levels of protection to present healthcare worker to healthcare worker transmission. So the next slide, uh, I'll, I'll just briefly emphasize uh, the, oh, sorry, I forgot I had this one in here. These are the physicians that uh, we have helped uh, expedite their uh, visits in occupational health over the uh, last uh, two and a half uh, weeks. And uh, yesterday, there was only four uh, physicians who uh, came through this portal. So uh, it does appear that uh, the, the numbers have gone down. Uh, but on the next slide is uh, uh, kind of our updated numbers from yesterday. A song helps make this graph every day. And uh, again, just emphasizing the point you've heard from multiple other uh, speakers this morning, that you see that as of yesterday, of roughly 1,200 faculty and staff tested, 32 had tested positive. Uh, and so the takeaway here is that although we all are anxious when we or our colleagues develop symptoms, 97% of, uh, of those in our environment who are healthcare workers who have had symptoms have those symptoms due to something other than COVID-19. Uh, those 32, as, uh, as Norm mentioned, many had uh, their exposure outside of clinical settings in either the laboratory setting at uh, national meetings or a partner at home who was positive several days before they turned positive. So it does seem that these numbers are very low. Uh, we're obviously continuing to track them, uh, and with the more rapid turnaround of the tests, it, it makes us keep this uh, very up to date. Uh, so next slide, uh, again, just wanting to emphasize for folks, it's often a source of anxiety if people feel powerless to protect themselves. These are some of the guidance that our uh, infection control team has put together of some tangible things you can be doing uh, as you transition from work to home to reduce the risk of spread uh, to your family. And so, again, want to just emphasize that we have very concrete things that we can do to reduce transmission risk uh, and, and keep our loved ones safe. Uh, so transitioning to the, the next slide, I'll uh, again be uh, brief here, uh, but want to reassure folks that much is being done in this space. And I think the Department of Medicine has really been at the front of this in identifying what each of our skill sets uh, are, where our comfort zones are, and so that if we have to do some redeployment that uh, we're drawing on uh, uh, in the initial waves, those who feel most prepared. There's been a great deal of work by Dr. Katz Nelson and uh, the GME office uh, around um, the preparation uh, if we have to uh, move house staff to different areas. And I think the primary thing that people want to know is that we're all willing to step in in this time of need, but we still want to have confidence that we're providing high quality medical care, that we're uh, you know, practicing good medicine and practicing high quality medicine for our patients, and that we have access to expert backup. And I think on that front, uh, very detailed plans have been built out of what the structure will look like if we do have a, a, a steep uh, curve. Uh, and you will always have uh, expert oversight in that circumstance. The, the only other piece here is just emphasizing that we tend to be a self-reliant bunch. And as we're entering this time where we're facing new decisions, encountering a disease that is new to all of us, uh, that we need to rely on one another. And we need to have lower thresholds of asking for help, especially when we're making challenging decisions. 
uh, and so just encourage folks to rely on one another. So I would advance to the next slide, and this is probably the part of this that you are uh, were thinking you were going to get uh, when you started this talk, uh, is really just meeting basic needs. Uh, and here are the fundamental components, childcare, lodging, emotional support, and just feeding people when they don't have time to shop, uh, trying to uh, put a meal on the table for family on these uh, very short turnarounds. So I'll touch on these things briefly. If we can go forward one slide. Uh, first, just on the childcare front. Uh, one more forward there. So our, our cornerstone or the centerpiece of the coverage is through Bright Horizons. Um, we each have 160 hours of uh, access to deploying a Bright Horizons childcare worker into your home. We also each have uh, up to $100 a day reimbursement through Bright Horizons for care you arrange. Uh, and that has been extended through the end of April. Right now, 85% of people are using the uh, in-home care that they arrange and being reimbursed. So that's the primary approach. The two things I would emphasize here, uh, Bright Horizons phone lines are, are really flooded. So you want to be using the website and the mobile app. Do not even bother with the phone line. It's not gonna serve you well. And I would also emphasize here, knowing that some listening in are broader than just the Department of Medicine. The one other piece to emphasize for our residents and fellows is that all residents and fellows at both hospitals need to be using the SHC account because that is where from a benefits point of view, you your benefits roll up. So be sure if you're a, a resident to be using the, the SHC account, even if you're based at Packard. Would also emphasize that this Bright Horizons benefit uh, can provide uh, individuals who have expertise caring for children with special needs. This benefit can be used for elder care it can be used for care for your pet when you're at work. So it's a very broad suite of resources available to meet all of those needs. Sitter City is also a, a benefit that Stanford provides through Bright Horizons that allows you to screen and hire sitters and caregivers for a longer term deployment. And I would say here that the HR teams and school medicine is keeping very accurate statistics on how much of the need is being met through these resources. And right now, about 95% of the need is being met. 95% of requests are being met. Um, so it's not all, and we're trying to understand that last 5% and under, uh, prioritize what's there and, and identify ways to solve it. But most of the need is being met through these resources. There have been multiple uh, looks at uh, providing, a, uh, providing an on-site drop-in center. Uh, we had over 3,000 uh, responses uh, uh, from uh, faculty and um, uh, employees across both hospitals to the uh, needs assessment on child care. And right now it's still a bit fluid. It's being looked at again this week. The challenge is that creating a drop-in center uh, defeats much of the shelter-in-place goal of why child cares were closed, but it does continue to be uh, looked at. The last thing I'll say here is uh, our medical students and graduate students on their own initiated this uh, program of uh, emergency care for residents, fellows, faculty for whom these other needs uh, are not filling their child care uh, needs. And so uh, that's a sort of a safety net resource as well that's available to you. So we can go to the next slide. Um, temporary lodging, uh, we uh, are in now a good place uh, as of about a week ago. So the first is that we have uh, free lodging provided by uh, uh, the hospitals for individuals meeting certain criteria. You see those criteria here. Uh, really focused around those working at the front line with uh, COVID-19 impacted areas, short time between end of current uh, uh, day and start of uh, uh, next day's shift, um, and then uh, those with a longer commute. I would emphasize here that this is that those criteria are available for all staff, not just our residents, fellows, and physicians. Um, but we do also have the ability to take exceptions through this process and for many of the faculty and residents and fellows, it's the exceptions that have been the biggest need at present and the 
a simple example I've been sharing but that's a real example that's affected several people is that there are uh, a resident with a couple roommates who uh, do not want them staying in their apartment um, during this time out of fear uh, of transmission. So we have several residents staying at the hotel under that uh, approach and we have a number of faculty staying at the hotel for other unique needs that uh, make sense in this time. So please recognize uh, this resource. Uh, we also have now discounted lodging with four or five hotels in the community uh, that are charging around $79 to $89 a night for hotels that would have cost four or five times that several weeks ago. And that's really for those who don't meet these criteria uh, for a uh, uh, free room, uh, but for whatever reason prefer to be away from their family uh, in this time. Uh, is, a, is another option. So you'll move forward a slide. Uh, I think the uh, next piece is just thinking about the emotional strain uh, that we're all dealing with. Uh, this is the data from healthcare workers in China, and I think notably you see that half experience symptoms of depression, uh, nearly half symptoms of anxiety, and a third insomnia. Nurses, uh, women healthcare professionals, and frontline healthcare professionals, which were uh, defined as those either directly involved with the diagnosis or clinical care delivery of individuals with COVID-19 infection were highest risk. If you uh, hit forward one on the animation, um, you see the uh, uh, hazard ratios. Maybe click forward. Uh, uh, for those who are at the front line of this, which uh, is many uh, of our colleagues in the Department of Medicine, and you note that even higher risk there, and in particular, the dramatic increased risk of insomnia among those at the front line. So if we advance forward, uh, uh, we have uh, been working to uh, uh, stand up supports around that uh, uh, with collaboration between the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science and the WellMD Center. Uh, we launched our first webinar yesterday. Uh, over 700 of you joined that session on managing anxiety related to caring for patients during COVID-19. It uh, was really a remarkable session with three Stanford experts uh, and taking questions from the audience. It will be posted on the Stanford CME site later today. Uh, and I encourage you to, to watch that session if you are unable to join. The next session will be led by uh, Dr. Roberts, uh, Chair of uh, Department of Psychiatry tomorrow evening, really focused on how can you talk to your kids uh, or young people about this pandemic and the stress they're experiencing. Uh, early next week, we will have a session focused on this challenge of insomnia that we just discussed. Uh, and uh, some of our Stanford experts around how to address that. And there are several other sessions that will be coming over the next one to two weeks that I hope you'll uh, drop into. Uh, our chaplains have been arranging a morning call that they hope to be able to offer broadly uh, sometime in the near future. That's just a brief call of time for uh, to read a poem or a prayer to just uh, center folks at the start of the day if that's something uh, of interest to you. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I think I may have the link to that first session of where we posted later today uh, from yesterday's session on anxiety. I think there was some, just some very practical things I'll, I'll say from that session as well that the experts were telling us, uh, one of which was just stop watching the news uh, or watch very little of it. And, you know, I thought a very practical piece of advice there was that if every day before you got in your car to drive to work, all you heard about was every accident in the United States, and particularly the most gory and gruesome ones, you would have anxiety for doing something that um, we all do regularly. And I think we're in that place with the way the media is covering this right now. So really titrate that. Schedule some time for something enjoyable to you each day. Really make time for that social support. That's the one thing in the studies from China for healthcare workers that really protected against some of these components of anxiety was relying on your coworkers or social support outside the hospital really helped mitigate some of that distress. So there were a number of very tangible uh, things to just think about making some conscious decisions in this session. If we go to the next slide, um, we do also know that some of you will be dealing with challenges 
that you need to discuss it with someone individually to think through or work through. Some of the immediate resources available now, uh, our peer supporters have been working with a number of folks in that setting to just think through some of the clinical challenges or uh, stress you're dealing with on the wards right now. University Help Center also available for faculty for our residents and fellows, the WellConnect program for staff EAP. There are a number of other supports being developed, but these things are all available to you now. And then uh, for those in 500P, the family resource space has been converted to staff respite. Uh, and so again, if you just need to disconnect and have a quiet space uh, in the middle of an intense shift, this uh, space is available for you. Um, so if we go forward, I think that might have been, oh, and then the last piece, uh, this one I do just want to say uh, uh, with very uh, clear certainty for you that you will be well cared for if you test positive and go out on quarantine. Uh, for the residents, fellows, faculty, medical students, the WellMD team has been providing that support for uh, nearly three weeks now. We reach out to every one of those folks. Um, we do an intake of any tangible needs that they have and, and make arrangements to meet those needs for they or their family. We do offer lodging to every one of these folks. Right now, because the hotels won't contract to take positive patients, what we've been able to offer for since the 13th is lodging for their family members if they want to live away from family members. We're close to having a contract with a hotel that has separate filtration for each room, air filtration, uh, and we hope to have that in place by the end of the week where we'd be able to offer also the option of the healthcare worker lodging in the hotel. Um, I will say that almost no one has taken us up on the housing option for this setting, even though we all sort of project that we might want that when people are actually in the circumstance they prefer to be at home in a, a spare room apart from a family, but in the same locale. But those options are available. Uh, our team calls them regularly, and we also have psychologists, psychiatrists available for support. I'll, I'll tell you that what's interesting is oftentimes people are physically start to feel a lot better by day six or seven, but they're then staring down another week of being on quarantine, and it's really the emotional piece of that, of wanting to get back to work and feeling that you know they're stuck in isolation and, and away from their family that's the most challenging piece of this. Uh, analogous programs have been launched for all employees of both hospitals through the HR teams as of last week. And so this is now uh, the type of support, slightly a different structure, but is being provided to all of our people. And I think the next slide is just sort of the map of some of the uh, support for those folks. So I don't need to go into the details of this, but uh, again, there's a very rigorous and robust support process if you are in this circumstance. So with that, I think uh, I'll conclude and uh, happy to just take any questions that come up, Carol, uh, of, that folks have. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Shanifal, thank you for that amazing presentation. Um, if I could just briefly, before we move on to questions, and we'll of course move on to questions that cover both uh, as well as uh, some of the other general themes we've been having. Uh, just a brief plug, and I did send a, a message through the uh, chats earlier that, um, and I was mentioning earlier at the very beginning that this uh, presentation will have CME, all previous presentations. Also, you can grab CME for it. Uh, this time we'll have it such that you'll need to go to a website, and I sent you the link to that to make sure you can log into your CME account, and then you can enter this code. Again, it was also sent in the chat and we'll be sending all this stuff via email to everybody as well. So don't worry about uh, missing it here, but make sure you have your CME account and you can go to the website to get CME for previous ones as well. You just have to say that you watched it. You don't have to do anything else other than that. So thank you to our CME folks for making this so easy uh, moving forward. So Dr. Stanifelt, thank you again so much for that great presentation. I'm gonna move off sharing here and we'll start off with our first questions. Um, naturally, uh, many of the questions were coming up since um, we started this presentation. So a lot of the questions are also uh, not necessarily with the wellness theme. Um, so we'll also try to mix in some of those questions as well. So they were kind of biased towards the non-wellness theme questions as they were being asked earlier and being voted up. All right, so the first question is regarding uh, a common thing we've been having recently, of course, about uh, protection. And Dr. Shanavalt may have some comments on these as well. 
Um, but uh, the general public has been uh, concerned. There's been a lot of controversy, controversy about wearing masks, homemade or N95. Um, any thoughts from uh, really any of our panelists here? Kind of a general question, uh, Dr. Risk, would you like to? Sure. Yeah, so the guidance that we're offering is that in patient facing areas, um, uh, surgical masks are recommended. In areas that are not patient facing, like staff areas where in finance or HR or other areas, if people cannot socially distance themselves, they should wear a mask. If they can socially distance themselves, they don't need to wear a mask. Surgical masks are mostly useful to entrap droplets of infected individuals. So if they protect people from the source, if the source is masked, uh, um, they don't protect you as much um, if the source is not masked and you wear the mask. Um, so uh, the guidance about using them is based on the prevalence in the community and the risk of being infected by other individuals. So we want people that may be asymptomatic and infected to be wearing a mask so they don't spread it. But again, if you can socially distance yourself from other people, it's not seen to be a hack. And then the are only useful for airborne uh, pathogens. Most of the spread of COVID-19 is not airborne, it's droplet-borne. Um, and the other thing to say about N95s is that they're only useful if you're actually fit tested. So picking one up in a hardware store, an industrial one, and wearing one that's not fit tested probably doesn't provide you any more protection than a surgical mask. So there, there are the guidelines are being reevaluated every day by the PPE task force and infection control. And I would take the internet guidance on it because it's very um, up to date. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Risk. Uh, and we're moving on to the next question. Jason asked, uh, when will we be getting the rapid less than one hour the, uh, detection tests? Maybe Dr. Risk. <laughs> as well. Um, we have 1,400 cartridges a month provided by the Silicon Valley company that um, is uh, putting out testing that takes about 45 minutes and a turnaround. We're prioritizing that for patients in the hospital that are under investigation, immunocompromised hosts, and healthcare workers, uh, in addition to patients in the ED. So um, that should probably be up and running probably tomorrow but it's limited in amount. We're obviously trying to increase the number of cartridges so we can increase that, that uh, rapid turnaround. There are other manufacturers like Abbott uh, is putting out one that's five to 15 minutes. They can produce 50,000 units uh, a day. And again, there's a torrent of demand. So if we can get any of that, it will probably not, not be uh, hundreds per day. Thanks so much. Um, Dr. Rich, you just kind of comment on this next question. You kind of answered partially of it, maybe maybe most of it, you, uh, about wearing simple face masks when not in patient areas. You did mention that this is being reevaluated on a daily basis. Anything else to add? Uh, no, I mean, I know a lot of people have seen universal masking take over everywhere. And that's partially to treat the concerns everybody has. If you can socially distance yourself in your non-patient facing areas, it probably doesn't confer an advantage to wear a homemade mask either. And, and the CDC's position on homemade masks is, has been somewhat inconstant, but largely it's not an advantage to wear a homeward, homemade mask. It might be an advantage to people in the environment if all of your droplets are deposited in the homemade mask. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do we have any updates on uh, antibody testing uh, at Stanford? or for the general public? I don't know if um, uh, Dr. Holabar or Dr. Risk as well, and I think many of you uh, are, uh, have been talking about this. I understand, uh, Marissa, we're planning on doing serology testing. It's being tested and validated at Stanford right now. And the important thing is that we need to make sure the tests are, have a high specificity and sensitivity before we start employing them. Is that about, sound about correct? I think that is, that's, that's right. 
I am aware that Dr. Montine's lab in pathology um, is working on a lot of this with colleagues across the institution. So it's definitely on everyone's radar. And you know, one of the things that many faculty have asked, you know, can we use these to test who, which faculty have been potentially already exposed and things like that I know are being uh, brought up in many levels as well. So as soon as we have serology testing, it's something that will make everybody aware of, but it has to be validated first. You know, Errol, maybe it would be good in a couple of weeks if we have Tom Montine and maybe Ben Pinsky come and join the panel because a lot of the questions do have to uh, do do with the laboratory tests. And they can, the fact that we've tested 7,000 people here, as Megan pointed out in her presentation, that's about the most in California uh, for a single institution. And so uh, we ought to have Tom and Ben talk about that. So why don't we put that on our list for the next week or two? Excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, speaking up, uh, Bob, a good point. Uh, so what we try to do based on the theme of the questions is help us guide the direction of future grand rounds as well and making sure we have experts. Uh, one common one will be surge questions. So talking with our team about potentially providing some updates uh, whenever we can. Um, so we'll try to do that as well. Thanks for that. Uh, any, uh, are there any plans for testing asymptomatic people anytime soon? That kind of goes along with serology testing in a way, um, but it just really just goes down to testing and having the resources. Dr. Risk, I see here. Yeah, so um, people will remember there's a central management committee called CORT. It's a clinical operations and research team. And um, it has a lot of subcommittees that deliberate about issues like PPE, our standards for testing, et cetera. And we anticipate um, today actually a CORT learning uh, new information about how we will broaden the testing. Um, the the um, recommendation is includes about 1,700 tests a day. So things that need to be prioritized are healthcare workers, probably preoperative surgeries, high-risk individuals like immunocompromised hosts or transplants. Um, there will be some testing of asymptomatic people in high-risk uh, situations. And of course, it will continue to be broadened as we have uh, the ability to do more volume. So it's, it's, um, there'll be communication about that uh, coming out probably in the next few days as well. So we do anticipate broader testing. We don't anticipate the ability to test all asymptomatic individuals in the environment. Because even if you test them, they might, they might, uh, change over in a couple of days from uh, negative to positive. And so we need to do, test people that have some outcome to it and some uh, effect on how we manage the situation. Great, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Rice, this actually might be a question for you. Our, our Stanford's policy on uh, uh, protocol for hypoxia restricting, avoiding non-invasive cause of ventilation of COVID patients and high flow oxygen. Thoughts on that? Yeah, so another subgroup of the court group is the COVID-19 uh, Critical Care Task Force, and they've been evaluating our standards using national recommendations and also local experience about how we manage respiratory failure. So the two controversial areas have been high flow nasal cannula oxygen, which um, the Society for Critical Care Medicine just came out and recommended as one way to stave off intubation. We've been issuing that because we're concerned about aerosolization, but a new recommendation on that will come out probably tomorrow. And I, I anticipate that we will be using more high flow nasal cannula oxygen. In terms of non-invasive non positive pressure ventilation is in the question like BiPAP. Um, it does aerosolize uh, some material and um, that increases the risk to healthcare workers primarily. Um, so we have tried not to do that, and most uh, critical care uh, units in the United States are also trying not to do that. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Risk. Uh, interesting question. Why does a regional medical center have much higher ICU total COVID cases? I think that's been somewhat the theme in South Bay. Uh, any thoughts on that? Sorry to be the, uh, <laughs> the sole panelist speaking. There's a lot of talent on the panelist team. But it's just an observation that the uh, southern uh, Santa Clara County seems to have a higher frequency. Um, and um, 
Not sure why that is. It's like, why are there focal hot spots in many places? Uh, it has to do with population density to some degree because of San Jose. Uh, but other than that, we don't have a good reason. Thank you so much. Um, I want to get some questions over. And, and uh, Dr. Schoenfeld, I know that there were some questions buried down that uh, just didn't have the time to get voted up. Can you give us a little more, there's some questions about working from home, a little more of your thoughts about recommendations and things we can do working from home uh, to make sure that we're both taking care of ourselves as well as both physically, but also mentally. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think, you know, there's an isolating component to working from home that we're apart from our coworkers, our teammates, our colleagues, precisely at a time where, you know, dealing with this distress. And so I think that one of the pieces to consider there is, you know, finding a regular time, at least a couple times each week, to have some type of a check-in with colleagues. And folks are doing many different creative things. Uh, and I know you've had many on the call who have done that, of having virtual happy hour a couple times a week with colleagues and a variety of different ways to, to connect. But I, I do think it's important that Again, drawing on that social support theme, that doesn't just mean your personal support. So oftentimes it's your colleagues who understand best some of the challenges that we're dealing with or some of the concerns you have. So thinking about ways to, to regularly have that connection, even though um, we're not necessarily in the workroom is important. Uh, again, I would say titrate what you're listening to in the media, because again, circumstances elsewhere are not the circumstance at Stanford. And the PPE is a perfect example of that. Um, you know, I think as Norm said, we, we would not want to say we don't need to be considering and using our PPE wisely, but I would venture that there is probably no institution in the United States who wouldn't change places with us right now uh, in how well our supply team has been doing. Um, so I think be careful what you listen to outside. Uh, and, and then I think, um, you know, thinking too about what you can be doing to be a positive support to your own colleagues is a very good thing to be thinking about. Uh, I think one of the things that really stood out to me in our uh, session yesterday is how infectious we all are to one another with respect to our levels of anxiety or our levels of calm and compassion and reassurance to one another. And so I think, you know, even if you're maybe uh, working from home, um, you know, recognizing our colleagues uh, are dealing with that stress, both those at home, but also those here and thinking about how are we encouraging those teams? How are we being a source of support to them? Uh, is, is allows us to be focusing on the positive elements of this and being a catalyst for a sense of calm and support, compassion to one another, uh, I think is a reframing uh, that can be very helpful. Dr. Shannonfeld, thank you so much for those words. Um, at, now that we're at just after nine o'clock, we're gonna go ahead and, and close. I wanted to make a couple quick announcements. Um, there is the uh, Healthcare and AI Conference that starts, I believe, right now, and I sent a link earlier to that. So, and that goes throughout the day today. Many of our faculty will be part of that. Uh, I also talked about CME. If you have any questions, please reach out to CME or, or let me know if I can help. Um, we usually make announcements are for PPE. If there are any PPE donation request, please do send that to the email I sent you, COVID-19 supplies at stanfordhealthcare.org. Thank you to Amanda Chala and the leadership. If there's any questions, people have been emailing me. I'm happy to um, help uh, triage uh, where to send the, your requests about PEP over to, so feel free to email me on that. And probably the last, my favorite announcement I wanted to make on the theme of wellness um, is the Stuck at Home series that uh, uh, Stanford School of Medicine has been uh, running, uh, ho hosted by Jacqueline Genovese and uh, hosted by Brian Lynn. Um, it's pretty amazing. I didn't know about this till yesterday. Uh, Brian emailed me about, we have faculty from throughout, not just our department, but the School of Medicine, graduate students to orthopedic surgeons showing off their talents uh, on piano and all sorts of all sorts of ways musically and singing this week we have many of our faculty as well so i uh, was really excited to learn uh, Baldeep Singh was such a great guitarist watching him play yesterday so uh, a lot of cool talent um, the next uh, event is tomorrow at 5:30. it's on zoom 
And I did send some info via the chat as well. And we'll continue we'll, as for communications, we'll send out email reminders of that as well to make sure you're all aware and make sure the recordings are somewhere where you can go see it if you can't watch it live. I wanna thank all our panelists again for your time and all your leadership during this time. And uh, uh, for everybody, if you have more questions, I'm sorry we can't get to all of them, but we'll do our best to answer everything. Please send us feedback on how we can make these sessions better and ideas for topics in future grand rounds. I want to thank the whole School of Medicine who's been part of this as well. And again, thank you, everybody. Hope you have a good day and be safe. Bye-bye.